Financial accountability in the family is a very thorny uh, subject. I know some of us are now belting up. Some of us are now shifting positions because you do not know what this speaker may be saying about that. Uh, but finances and stress, finances and stress go hand in hand. So if you want to, to know where stress lodges, find a place where accountability has been thrown through the window. But also financial, finances and peace of mind can go hand in hand. Money is consistently among the top sources of stress for many people in the world, Kenyans, but also for Christians who are not insulated from the same. And a survey done revealed that parents of children under 18 are more likely than adults with no children to have higher financial st uh, stress and are likely to feel financially, uh, are unlikely to feel financially sec secure. Now, it has been said that our schools don't teach about money. And so most of what we learn about money is picked from home, and sadly to say by default, because nobody sits us down and says, this is how money should be handled, this is how you should handle your finances. We develop our attitudes and beliefs about money or finances in childhood. Uh, we learn very little, and, and I, I regret to, to say this, that even as we do uh, seminars and conferences on financial breakthroughs, very little is being learned, because much of what would control how we account for our finances was learned in our childhood. And as it's been said, it's very hard to teach an old dog a new trick. And we are trying to teach these old dogs new tricks. Hope the Lord would help us. By talking often about money and finances and modeling good money management habits will set your children up for a future of financial success. Financial accountability must be first on any, uh, must be first and foremost in the eyes of any serious organization, but also must be first in the eyes of any serious family. This is where families rise and fall. The things we are dealing with in conflict management, the things we are dealing with in communication issues, a, a greater part of them, if they don't come from issues of sex, they come from the issues of money. And the issues that have messed up sex relationships have stemmed from how finances were handled. And so we, we trust that those who name the name of Christ would present higher standards of financial accountability. We know that this is a major issue. It is, it, is, it is not the best subject to tackle in Kenya at a time like this. But if, if we do not rise and provide a solution and give a voice to this, chances are the rest of the world would never know what to do. When, or if they know, they know the management part. But in this uh, conversation this morning, I want to slip into the secret chambers and discuss the moral parts of it. I would leave my friends and colleagues in the business world to talk about the management part of it, but I would want to discuss a little bit with us on the moral part of it. The Christian couples would find happiness as a derivative. And there is, a, there is a fallacy in families today, and we pursue it consistently. We aim at having happiness in our families, and this is very good. 
But listen to this. Christian couples will find happiness as a derivative from, the, from their marriage. But the highest goal of cre Christian marriage is not happiness and convenience. It is to glorify God and especially with, their, with our wealth and our possessions. So in the process of glorifying God, if you have happiness, praise the Lord. That is a bonus. But the Lord would not spare his glory at the expense of our happiness. He would not spare his glory at the expense of our convenience. And yet, most of us come to uh, services like this armed. Armed to block anything, any idea that would seem to shift our traditions of how we handle finances and how accountable we are. Financial accountability results from holding an individual accountable for effective performing a financial activity, such as a key control procedure within a financial transaction process. Now, where I come from, you don't ask men what they did with their salary. In fact, it's a taboo. You would look like you lack respect. We have the pleasure and honor to spend without questions. And so it would be difficult if I have my neighbors in the congregation, I would deliberately engage this war because I know where we stand. Accountability means the state of being responsible or answerable for a system, its behavior, its potential impacts, Accountability is an, an, an acknowledgement of responsibility for actions, decisions, and products. Responsibility in this case can be legal or moral or ethical. So I, would, I will choose to go the other branch of moral uh, responsibility. Now, what is moral accountability? It is the readiness, the preparedness to give an explanation or justify to relevant others, the stakeholders, in this case, your family. You are able to justify your judgments on how you have handled finances. You are also willing to explain your intentions. You are also willing to explain your acts, why you are able to go to a hotel and take pilau and come home and subject everybody to sukuma and ugali. That is what we call moral accountability. You have to explain your intentions why you have a new suit and everybody has been using clothes bought two years ago. This is accountability. You have to explain things, finances, and this is, it is a moral duty. Now, my best definition of moral is, morals are the prevailing standards of behavior that enable people to live corporately in groups. So, Morals refer to what society sanction as right and acceptable. Most people tend to act morally and follow society guidelines. We have the acceptable norm in this church, how things are done. And it's, if you do something that is not within that moral circle, they would ask you to explain because it is contrary to the normal standards of functioning in this particular room. There are moral standards, either intentionally or by default, in every family. They are either written or they are just somewhere, but when you do things, you'd realize they are there. 
I don't say it, but when I send my children with my money, they know, even without asking, that they have to bring change and a receipt. That is why the self-proclaimed chief finance officer of the Alukwes is not a very good one. But those are standards. It is a moral standard. You don't eat in my house. And for you who have never come, please know this before. And you don't eat in my house and just stand up and walk away. Who are you? Please. It is unacceptable that you stand up from the table and never say thank you. It's immoral in my family. So morals are accepted standard principles that govern and organize a group. And some of us have lived in the church today as though the church is the only community that does not have moral standards. So we can walk in and do whatever we want. Sometimes back I told you that my children know that as long as I am paying rent, they have to be home before dark. And if they are going to be late, thank God they have phones. They have to pick a phone and say, Dad or Mom, I'm sorry we will be late. Those guys you've heard me mention, lawyers and accountants, they adhere to those morals. This is my home. And if you feel they are not very good, you're welcome to, to live. Because I will be accountable of how I handle each one of them. I am not doing it for fun. I have the moral duty, not before the government, but before God, to explain why somebody caught a strange behavior in my family and I never said anything. I have a moral duty to explain why. And that is why it is so painful to be a father, to be a mother. Please understand, those who have parents, that some of these things are not done for fun. It is a painful procedure, yet a necessary one. So, every community, even the church, has prevailing standards of behavior. And so, when I was growing up, I was told that it's table manners to be quiet when you eat. My mother has a problem when she visits because the prevailing standard in my house is different from her house. That in my house, eating time is fellowship time. But in her house, when we ate, we had to keep quiet. So when she visits, she has now to test my moral standards around table etiquette. And she has to forget her own. So each, each one of us must understand that even the church has the acceptable behaviors that are required of us in handling finances and whatever positions the Lord gives us. Now, I would invite three narratives this morning to help us discuss this topic. Some of you may realize I'm a very good student of Luke, and this is where I got my doctorate, and so I have picked passages from Luke again. So I would, we would look at the narrative of Luke, the prodigal son. 
We would also look at the narrative of Anania and Sapphira, and then we would look at the narrative around Simon the Sorcerer. Now, looking at Luke, this is a very hard place to begin. You know, this parable talks about a man who had two sons. And the younger one wakes up one morning. I don't know what went through his mind. We never know what goes through the minds of our sons. But we only know what they say. So he wakes up and says, Dad, put here what belongs to me. And by the way, you might think that is a very easy work to do. But it's very hard to ask somebody to give you things that he has worked for. Things that he owns. Things that he has to sign to transfer to you. I had a very interesting father-in-law. He had, he, he had six sons and six daughters. And so in every wedding, he would encourage the sons and the daughters to give birth to more children, just like him. So one of these days, I'm told, he had received dowry from one of his daughters. And so the sons thought that the father was going to do something. <laughs> and so they waited for long and they discovered if we do not do something, he might not do something. So they decided to do something, visit him in the evening, two of them. And you know this is a hard subject to begin. When you want to ask what doesn't belong to you, you have to look for good words. And so they are seated, they are looking at one another. And so eventually, my father-in-law turns to the sons and says, what is the problem? And they look at one another and say, Dad, we had come. <laughs> and I said, for what? He said, you, we have come. And then eventually, one of them gathers strength and says, you have not told us how the visitors behaved. <laughs> and he said, okay, you know you are here. I don't think I have anything more to say, just what you saw. He said, no. We were thinking, have you any plans? <laughs> and then he understood where they were going. And he asked them, sons, do you have children? They said, yes. Do you have daughters? They said, yes. Now listen to me carefully. Who was the father of the daughter that, was, uh, that I received the dowry? He said, it's you. I want to help you. This is my daughter. What has been given is mine. If I choose to throw it in the ocean, it's upon me. If I choose it to, to eat it here, leisurely and quietly with my wife, it is my choice. And I want to encourage you. Also, when your daughters come to this place, I will not interfere. <laughs> Asking people for what does not belong to you is very hard. And so you should respect the prodigal son. You can't go before an old man who has been laboring all these years. You don't know what he was told at the place of work and just say, put here. And you see the language, especially of my brothers-in-law and the language of my prodigal son here seems like a, a language of robbers. There are only robbers who come to your house and command you to give them what belongs to you. We are not told what the father does, what the father, I mean, we are not sure whether he challenged the, the request, 
but he counts all that falls to him, which culturally that was third, because the firstborn must get two portions as an heir of the family. So if this was uh, one million, he must have gone with a third of that, and the firstborn retained through the father the other two thirds. But the Bible says he moved immediately, not many days, he moved to a far country. And he began to spend. And I want you to observe what happens when we major on spending what we have. So not many days, the Bible says he was without funds again. And this is not a time you want a disaster. But we all know that when you are low on funds, it is the time many needs arrive. It is just that they are locked somewhere and waiting for your bankruptcy. And immediately you are declared one, they knock. So when he had spent everything, then famine struck in that particular land. And bankruptcy and famine may be as cruel as we think, but they taught this young man something. They brought him back his senses. And that is what some of us require sometimes that you know, we spend without our senses. But when he gains his senses and comes back home, we have another problem. There is a good son that remained there. And this good son comes home and he finds dance and music and celebration. And he wants to know what is happening. And the elder son explains very well in his anger. And he says, Father, this is un unfair. How is it that I have been home? All you live on is my share. But all this time you've never done something like this to me. But your son, who has lived with who has lived recklessly and spent his wealth with the hallowed comes home and you have this celebration. That this is, this is unfair. So we have two sons here. One spends recklessly and one I think he is a hoarder, he is a miser uh, like me. And when you have sons and you have children of this nature, the best advice is to get another one. <laughs> How do you live with these two extremes? One who has everything, but he doesn't want to enjoy it. And the other one who has everything, but he spends it. In fact, the Bible says he spends it carelessly and recklessly. And some of us even question God and say, God, I am a good tither. I do this, I do this, I do this in your house. Why is it that always I am in trouble with my funds? The answer is, if you faithfully give tithes to God and spend the 90% recklessly, you will be a broke tither. So he has two sons, and the other one, I would call them, I've, I've, I've renamed them wisely and carefully, that the first, the firstborn, I think he's the most dangerous one. If, even with the reason of that parable, he's the most dangerous one. The one who is always perceived as holier than thou, the one who is always at the father's house, making sure everything runs. Huh? There are those of us here whom you cannot not miss at the right place. 
But there are those of us here, whether we come for service or not, we are just reckless. We are that prodigal. And also, the prodigal son is wasteful. And he is reckless. The brother is a miser and stingy. You can see it from the parable. He is wondering why the... Have you ever wondered why your family should eat meat? You are the firstborn. Have you ever wondered why your wife should have a new dress? Have you ever wondered why you should buy a chair in the church? Honestly. There are so many, and you have very good reasons. There are two extremes that the church has to learn to deal with, especially the age bracket that earns a six-digit salary. We pray that they don't drift into the wasteful attitude. But also we pray that they will not drift into the hoarding attitude. Because I told you the safest thing to do when you have two sons of this kind, please trust God for a third son. Who would bring a balance? Let, let, me, let me share what I think about the, the prodigal son. And, and, and this is a representation of how we handle fin funds and finances in our family. There are those who feel I'm not responsible. Nobody should ask what I do. There are those who feel otherwise. We realize that the prodigal son spent his fortune with people he assumed that they were friends. But his brother says, and it's only his brother who says the truth. He says, your son has spent his fortune with harlots. You know how you, re, how you commend on your brothers and sisters. It is, your, brother has spent, your son has spent his fortune with harlots. Harlots are simply people who give, who earn money by offering services of their body, whether men or women. And it's not just sexually. There are people who are around you, they are attracted physically of, because of what they can get out of you. Not necessarily that they are your good friends. So he hooks up with these people who are out to help him spend. But we also told the first son had friends because he had friends that he had never thrown a party for. Not because he was poor. And we have some of us who labor so hard and faithfully. And yet joy and pleasure is just a word that is not in our vocabulary. No wonder the, the wise man says there are people who gather in this world and they leave it to, for others to enjoy. And so he's saying, I have friends, but you have never even given me a small goat. But here is this harlot who has come home and you have slaughtered a fattened calf. This is not good. So we are dealing with people their philosophy of handling funds is different. The other one is a spendthrift. The other one is a miser. And they are both in the father's house. Hello. Hallelujah. Are we still breathing? Check if your neighbor is alive. We have two sons in the house. The one who believes to spend carelessly. And, and you know I'm a big problem because my, my personality is a choleric and my wife is a sanguine. So you can imagine the kind of wars we go through when it comes to money. 
My wife wants the table spoiled, and I want the table very lean. The worst of all, her first training is a, 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 a hotelier, so she knows what to do with money when it comes to food. I know what to do with food, but I don't like what money does. <laughs> Friends, the way you give to the house of God has nothing to do with riches. It has everything to do with an attitude that has been wired in you and sometimes very early in your childhood. I would never forgive, forgive my, uh, my uncle. When I went to college, he gave me pocket money. To be precise, 200 shillings those days. That was a lot of money. And I was happy. But he turns and says, hey, son, wait a minute. Write down everything you buy with that money. So honestly, uncle, so even when I buy uh, patko, patko those days were nice sweets. I don't know where they went. So if, if I buy patko, I should write. He said, write down. So every evening, I had to go through a painful experience. And I have to do it because I love money and the giver demands that I have to write. And this is the problem with me and my wife. When we go shopping, I go with a list. If it's me who has brought up the idea, we have a list. But if she's going for shopping, she just walks in. And you know, when she walks in without a list, I pull out my phone and go to the calculator. <laughs> so she picks, I add, she picks, I add, she picks, I add. And we go to this shelf, she picks and say, we, have, we don't have enough. Choose what you, you put back to the shelf. Our giving is simply an attitude. Some of it we have picked up in our childhood. Some of it we picked up from our fathers. And I don't know, I didn't see my father long enough to know how he behaved with money. But I wouldn't advocate for him. I wouldn't throw in a bone for him. I might be his uh, replica. And when we have terrorized our families, for lack of a better word, when we have tortured our children and our wives and husbands with those uh, attitudes, we grow the boldness now to take them to the higher level. And the next victim is the church. So when my wife picks things in the supermarket, I write. You know where that behavior would land? Ultimately, here. So when they announce we need this, I have my calculator. <laughs> my wife could be saying, amen, amen. I'm, I'm wondering, what is it that she's saying amen? And I have not known how much it costs. The prodigal son and the brother. These guys may have lived, if they did, thousands of years back. But they are true representation of what we are today. There is, this is the attitudes we carry before the father in his house. Some of us, it, the Lord has blessed us amazingly. But the problem is... We have to bleed. Somebody has to kill us to get out of that, those possessions to bring to the house of God. Somebody must scare us. Pastor Patrick, you may need to learn how to preach. 
because there are people here who would not give unless you make their world extremely uncomfortable. Scare them. And sometimes even, even promise them nothing and say, I see the Lord taking you somewhere. <laughs> and some of them bring curses on them. It is unfair, but this is how they are drawn. And out there they have found pastors who have learned the skill. <laughs> and God forbid, see how they are dying. And we are here. We might laugh. God forbid. I don't know what I'm saying that makes you very happy. But these are attitudes that we have to deal with because they are rampant everywhere. When you see elders in other churches, when elders say, Pastor, preach your holy thing, we will see what you'd eat. <laughs> and then there is the other one who sells the whole land brings the whole salary, they have not told their wives, they have not told their husbands, and they bring to the house of God. So pastors are always accused as robbers. And on the other side, they are dealing with stingy, hard to break attitudes. The second narrative. So the first one we are seeing that Attitudes of stinginess, carelessness, foolish spending. And you know, foolish is not a very good word. But I know people here who would fight you as good as they are in Christ. They will not take it lightly if you call them fools. But the prodigal son was not just careless in spending, but he was also foolish in spending. And I learned how foolish you can be thinking you are very wise. I wanted to build a house. And you know, a house is a personal thing. And, and don't take me to the finance bill. A, a house is a personal thing. I wanted to build a house. And so I went to the circle. But before that, my eyes were bent on buying a car. So when I shared with my good friend and he abused me, and he's a bishop, he told me, you want to buy a car? to park before that shack. I had a small house that did not look, the best thing that would fit with it is a bicycle. Parking a bicycle before it. Nobody would ask you a question if they found a bicycle there. But if they found a car before that, today I see the sense in what my friend told me. He, in, in essence, he told me you are very foolish. You want to park a car before this thing. So I shelved my vision. And I went to the circle and, 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 and took a loan. And the fundi did a big house that I did not need because my neighbors that, they are, that were allocated bedrooms are no longer home. My neighbors are my sons and daughters. <coughs> so again, another friend visits and says, my friend, you are very foolish. <laughs> How do you spend all this money on a house that you only use one week in a year? And here this, this protocol again was, and, and truly, and he told me, you know what? I have not built a house at home. I have built a house where I work because if people tell me that I need a place to sleep, this is not logical. My mother's house is there. When he visits town, he sleeps in my house. So when I also visit the village, I will sleep in her house. <sighs> so my foolishness with cars and houses, this is where they brought me to. A 
And you can easily declare yourself a prodigal son without knowing. Because when you spend carelessly, unadvised, you represent the, the younger son. And the second part is Luke chapter 5. The church is being blessed so much. And God is moving. And by the way, do you know today is Pentecost? I pray that the spirit of Pentecost would be here. I've realized that the, the biggest problem in church is not the, the preaching, the receptivity, the willingness to buy into these new ideas and work with them. That is the biggest problem. You, you, you are ready to spend your two hours in church, just listen to somebody and throw away whatever they say. So the church is being blessed and everybody can see and people begin to give faithfully to what the Lord is doing. And there is a couple that sits and evaluates and analyzes the situation and says we are also going to give. But you see, I told you, morals are acceptable standards in a community that bind that community for smooth running. So in the community in Acts, it is very clear, a statement is made again and again, saying, and none of them claimed that what they had was indeed theirs. So that was a moral principle, that as a community we declare that what we have is not ours. Nevertheless, it does not mean we are going to be careless, but we are not going to stand anywhere and claim ownership of this. So that is the principle. And so everybody looks at the situation in the, in the house and gives what they can. Without being preached to, without being coerced, without being scared. They give. And give a lot. And then, Anania and Safira think this looks like a good idea. And I think this was a good business. This was a good business family. They, they saw an investment opportunity in the house. And so they, they spend this evening discussing that that property in Munyaka, we are going to sell it. And we, though this community believes that whatever we have is not ours, we don't have to follow what everybody is saying. That is them. We can enjoy the community life, but live on different moral principles. And this is the coup we attempt in the house of God. That we want to live in the house of God, enjoy the warmth of his presence, but yet live on different moral principles than what he has given. So they come and say, we will sell it. And I don't know, this might be a, must have been a, woman as, a woman's idea. <laughs> Hello, ladies. <laughs> ladies are resourceful. I tell you. There is nothing resourceful like a woman. How do I know that this must have been a woman's idea? She comes late. So she sets up the husband to meet the heat. And so Ananias, foolish as he was, he carries the offering. And he comes. Now every community has a system that checks how they are doing. And the community in Jerusalem had, an, uh, had an, uh, an occupant, a habitant. They had an occupant in that community called the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the church would realize that before just looking at senior, Pastor Patrick and others, that we would realize that there is an occupant of this house that sometimes he doesn't show up until we are out of order. And so as Ananias come, 
Peter has a simple question. And this is not a question that many pastors today would ask. How dare you? Huh? Kwan ni yako? Kama unataka yako, siwache kuhubiru katafute kazi, ujenge yako. So we have leaderships that receive whatever they are given as slaves without interrogating the attitudes and spirits behind the giving. But not Peter. So he says, Brother Ananias, is this all? Imagine, brother, if you brought an offering and I asked you such a question. Would you ever forgive me? <laughs> huh? Was this judgment for my all? So is this all? And Anania in a very spiritual way. I think Safira had coached her, him. The coach doesn't play. The coach only comes to oversee the player. <laughs> but when we win, the coach wins. So Anania turns on the spiritual pious and godly mode and it says man of God the Lord has been so gracious he has blessed us beyond measure and we have just felt that we should stand with what he is doing in this church and if it were not Peter maybe me and Pastor Patrick would be saying hallelujah yeah. glory to God Lord you have seen that project it was just about to stall but the true owner of the project will not take anything less than what his moral standards require. True. Yeah, true. And Peter says, you're not going to be deceitful. And some of the giving in the church today is, is saddled on a deceitful spirit. We are not genuinely giving. We are giving because we want to look like somebody. We want to look like Barnabas. All the songs that were so, sung in the last service, I think I also need to be mentioned. The prayers that were made for Barnabas to prosper, for giving his house, I cannot miss, I cannot miss this blessing. Now, the passion and anger you exhibit in spiritual things, I dare put it to you, it's not genuine. Sometimes it's not genuine because you want to be like brother so and so. So we have wasteful giving, hoarding spirits, but now very deceitful ones. Pastor Patrick, when I visit you, please don't count my first visit serious. Wait for the second one. Because when we visit the first time, we are creating room for the real visit. I don't know, you missed the joke. <laughs> when I see somebody visit, I say, oh, Mr. Director, I, I just wanted to come and say hi. I know he would be coming. And what he does now is a trailblazer for the next visit. So you come and give me an envelope and say, Director, you, you can do fewer. I will keep that envelope because I don't know what you're going to say when you come. I know you will come. <laughs> Deceitful giving. Because we give. We take people out for lunch. We buy people gifts. We do some things that are very deceitful out to strategize how we rip out from them. And that is Ananea and Sapphira. Deceitful giving. And then the last one is the most dangerous. Simon the Sorcerer has been the name of the town. Not because he was born again, but because he was a, a magician. But he loses business when the Holy Spirit falls on the Christians and then the, the word in town now is not Simon, the word in town is Jesus. And he says, I'm not going to fall out of business. I must find a way to get back 
into business. And so he strategizes and says, this guy, when he lays hands on people, they begin to speak in new tongues. And the, I might not know the technicalities, but I know this is a good thing for business. And so he says, Peter, man of God, I have been praying and seeking the Lord about this. You know, the Bible says he also believed and he was baptized. So you can never explain this Christian away. He is only that he is still very manipulative, very scheming. Say, I have been seeking the Lord, and I, I think I enjoy the ministry the Lord has given you. But a minute, would you take this offering and consider selling this thing to me so that when I lay hands on people, they can also receive it? You know the church is cursed when they begin to sell spiritual things. You know the church is cursed when we begin to tell people that take this water. It's blessed water. You can never buy spiritual things. You don't need a connection for your healing other than the cross of Calvary. And we can sit in congregations speaking and preaching the word of God nicely like this ones, but we have, we have needs that we take somewhere else. Huh? You attend several services. So you are here to hear the word, but you're somewhere else to buy things. There is a supermarket you visit somewhere. They are willing to sell out things. They are selling oil. They are selling soil. They are selling soil, the brooms and everything. And when you give to those things, you think you are doing some good thing. But this, Peter says, Simon, your heart is not right. People who involve themselves in this kind of givings, their hearts are not Come on, you don't sell me air. It is God who gives me oxygen. Their hearts are not. Ah, oh, come on. Their hearts are not. If this is how you handle finances, if this is how you deal with the blessings and possessions that God has given you, your heart needs work. Somebody in the name of the Spirit of God needs to work on us again. It is pathetic that we cannot faithfully account for how we spend our money. And, 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 and the third son I suggested would be the balance. And I think in the prodigal space, that was the father. He knew how to spend. And our father in heaven has said, try me in this. Come on, he knows that you are stubborn. That is why he uses that language in Malachi and say, try me. In this, I have been approaching you. I've done all necessary as a father. But anyway, try me in this. By what? Giving your tithes and offering. Paul says there is, I am afraid, Corinthians, that there's, the enemy would move you from the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is very simple. Number one, give your tithes. Tithe is simply by that name, the 10% of every income. Your bonds, your shares, your salary, your farm, 10% of it pay back to the owner. I said pay back to, regardless of who you are. Some of us are trying to bring a theology, you know, tithing is optional. Try it at home. Because this community has moral standards. You, you try it at home. And probably if you would visit and find Anania and Safira wherever they are, you would ask them how those people who ignore those standards end up. And everybody seems to be doing well with tithes because it's spelled out, it's 10%. 
So you just calculate. If you are like me, my, my phone does it very well. Just go and I put the figure and I strike 10% and it tells me, as painful as it is, it's not mine. I have to give. Nobody in this world pays a debt smiling. Ah, ulikopa lakini kulipa, walipa lakini na, eh, na matusi juu yake, as if, ul... huh? God, don't you understand I have this need and that need? Come on, it is not yours, just pay, and when you pay, you become a godly person. Eh, this is the right thing to do. But the biggest challenge in our financial accountability comes with the offering. Because if I'm able to tithe 10,000, why would I give 50 shillings for an offering? An offering is supposed to demonstrate my love for God. If you took God out for lunch, how much would you spend on him on Sunday afternoon? 50 bob? just to show him how you love him. My brother, if I did a good job here preaching and you had mercy on me <laughs> and said, let's meet at Boma Inn, how much would you spend over me? Don't tell them. I would just see it on the table when we get there. But honestly, if, God, if you took God out for lunch, would you spend 50 shillings, 100 on him? Is that a demonstration of love? And I have a problem with Christians. There are Christians who will take out a pastor and spend lavishly on him and never pay tithe. And there are those ones who pay tithe and they come to church and they just give a hundred bob. My friend, you are doing very well, but not for this community. You are very cunning. You are very crafty. But when it comes to buying sacred things, you plant seed. And you can be sure that these things must be dealt with first and foremost at family level, not at church level. God is saying it is not going to be wasteful it is not going to be a stingy business. It is not going to be deceitfulness, neither manipulative giving. It is very clear. Pay back my tithe, demonstrate your love for me. As simple as that. So if you love me, it is you who can decide how much you love me. And since we learn these things at home, it is very dangerous. Because we see what our fathers and mothers do. It is dangerous for your son and daughter to see what you drop in the offering bag. Because that is what they will begin with. A young man, a small child saw that the grandfather was given food in a corner. On a plastic plate. So after a few, a few days... He was found busy in the garage working on something. And so the father asked, son, what are you doing? He said, dad, I am I'm preparing a plate for you. A plate for me on wood? He said, yes. I thought you needed a change. Because grandpa uses plastic, I thought you'd like wood. When you grow up, I would put you in a corner the way you do so that you can have your food on this wooden plate. Your family is a learning classroom that it would be very painful to account for the things that happened 